live there. Yep, and there we are. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Gardella. I am a social media and blogging consultant working out of Doylestown, Pennsylvania. As many of the people who have followed my story know, I care deeply about the world of divorce. I had a very peaceful divorce from my ex-husband, and when he passed away, it's my great honor to continue his legacy, as I talked about in my TED Talk back in 17. Now, one thing that has really hit me hard during the pandemic are the number of families that are probably struggling right now working through a divorce that's currently going on, living together and wanting to get a divorce, or the pandemic is causing them to want to get a divorce. So I had a lot of questions and I decided to bring on my buddy here, Hannon Isaacs of the Kingston Law Group, to talk about some of the issues. So first off, I want Hannon to introduce his firm. Good morning, Hannon. Good morning, Jennifer. It's my pleasure to be here. These are difficult times and together we can make a difference. So I've been practicing family law for 40 years in central New Jersey. And my present firm is called Kingston Law Group. We have two lawyers, a paralegal, a bookkeeper, and some itinerant other folks who help us. And our idea is that we should be compassionate counsel to our clients and tough advocates um, when we need to be regarding the other party or their counsel. And our commitment has been just that for many, many years. And people understand that when they deal with us. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today. And I really appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. So tell me, first of all, what's going on with the courts and how are divorces moving through right now? The New Jersey courts, as have most states and federal courts, um, have basically closed for regular business. Uh, nobody's allowed to go to the courthouse unless they have a really good reason to do it, even judges. And so what's happened, as in most of other areas of work life, is things have shifted to a Zoom-like <laughs> culture. So uh, you can still file documents with the court electronically, and you can get a judge's attention, especially if it's an emergency, like a domestic violence restraint case. Um, you can have hearings on pending matters. It's very different from how it was six weeks ago. You have judges who haltingly sometimes, others with great facility, are able to conduct Zoom meetings, sometimes with a court administrator who knows what they're doing. And, um, you know, they do their best. You can actually have people put up your right hand, swear in, and testify about certain things if that's called for. Okay. And for couples that want to start the divorce process, can they start to do that with your office now? Um, yes. You, okay. Yes, they can do that. Um, the idea would be we cannot represent both parties. Okay. So as, if people are getting along, like you described with yourself and your ex-husband, through the process, one party, whichever one, can work with us in an electronic environment and start the process electronically with the cooperation of the other party as well. So yes, that can be done. It is being done. Okay. And as couples are now sitting around their homes, um, arguably with not a whole bunch to do, what kind of documents do you want to see them prepare for so that they can work with you the most efficiently? Like what do they need to show you to get the process started? The most important documents are going to be financial. We okay. want to see... W-2s, 1099s, a tax return from uh, 2019. Um, there might be some other things, but the, the essentials are that type of financial documentation. On top of that, if the parties can cooperate, which is great, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. <laughs> you know, cooperation works better than contention. Um, we, we would like to get what's called a case information statement or as close to that standard as we can get, which basically details uh, the marital history of expenses, regardless of where they came from. It could have been loans, could have been gifts. Um, you know, what's the historic lifestyle that these parties have set and get it realistic. Like, so if somebody got a big, big bonus or a, a um, you know, 
severance check in 2020 that's not reflective of the marital lifestyle, well, we'll maybe we'll average or we'll discount mm -hmm. something. Um, but we really want to get that historic baseline. And then we want to look at for each party and the children when they're with each party, how much are they actually spending? So the case information statement asks for income, outflow, assets, and liabilities. So you're really getting a solid financial picture of what's going on with these folks. Right. Okay. So as many financial documents as they can give you, that's good because a lot of people don't understand it and they waste a lot of money with attorneys going back and forth as they're not completely organized and prepared. So that's good to know. Right. Now, as, you, as I've always said, while divorce attorneys like you are legal experts, they also take on the role of I don't want to say a therapist or a counselor, but they certainly have to have emotions in check. As couples who may not be getting along are now locked in their homes together, what are some things that you would recommend that they do to kind of keep the, the peace as they work through this time? So a few thoughts come to mind. First of all, a therapist. Therapists are yeah. seeing people via Zoom and other similar uh, modes. And if you have one, you should continue to work with that person. If you don't, this would be a good time to get that introduction. And our office can make that. Okay. Uh, that could take a few forms. Uh, it certainly could involve individual therapy. Uh, excellent idea for people. It can involve couples counseling, but some couples are going to say, or at least one of them, we're not reconciling. So why are you asking us to do this type of therapy? Well, there's something called separation counseling, where that piece is on the table. And the issue becomes, what's the best way for these people to move forward, separate, deal with issues like child custody, parenting time, child support, alimony or spousal support, division of property, and uh, the issue of how's this process going to get paid for. So the therapist may not have direct experience with the law, but basically if you have a good lawyer and a good therapist, you're going to do well, <laughs> relatively speaking. That's really a great way to go. Another suggestion would be create space where there's not very much space. And how do you do that? My suggestion to people is think about as a model, um, one parent stays with the kids in the house for X days a week, could be three, could be five, could be a week, and the other parent then takes the kids. Now, in my view, the best possible arrangement, and uh, Jennifer, you may want to speak to this at some point, is what we call a nesting arrangement. That is, the kids stay in place and the parents are the ones who go back and forth. And how do they do that? They can rent something. Each parent can go back to their own parents if their parents are alive and close by and have a place for them. Um, you need some place where you can reliably go when you're not at the residence. So creating space where there's not very much of it is an extremely important idea. When you take people who are not doing well and you add a ton of frustration, and you put them in a sealed box, <laughs> it's possible that only one of them is going, coming out alive. <laughs> and so we want to really avoid the aggravation. And that's what you're talking about. And that's what I'm concerned about, is that people are literally, they're, they're pushed into a situation that they did not ask for. They cannot change very much. And, and told, hey, why don't you cope here? Right? So a third piece would be, Things like good diet, good exercise, good sleep habits, you know, things that will sustain us no matter what the stressor might happen to be. Journaling is an excellent thing to do. I always say to people, make sure you keep it in a safe place that's not going to uh, be subject to prying eyes. Right. You know, literally, it could be in the trunk of your car. It could be at the house of a friend or a relative. But getting out your thoughts and concerns on paper so that you have a perspective, you can share that with your therapist. It will guide you, um, you guide yourself through this process as you need to. Yeah, I actually recommend to people uh, that are concerned about privacy issues to open up a Google Drive 
and write their thoughts in a password protected document. You know, if you're really concerned about prying eyes that way. Uh, to your point about nesting, I will share here that my ex-husband and I did write our own divorce over there in New Jersey. Now to most divorce attorneys, this is an absolute nightmare. We had a lot of peace. So when things started to fall apart that we hadn't thought about during the writing process, we definitely relied on that peace to get through them. But when I've talked about the nesting issues that we had, such as how long is it going to continue? Continue. It's a great model. It does not work forever. So it keeps your kids emotionally stable. It keeps them in the house. They don't have to switch schools. Their favorite teddy bear is always with them. It is a little bit stressful, though, on the parents as far as finances, maintaining that marital home still for the kids. Just if the roof caves in, who's going to pay for it? And when you work with an attorney, you know, it's not going to cost you that much money to sit down and get all those ideas out on paper. And I really wish that I had had that when John and I were divorcing because we, again, were lucky that we had the peace, but we did not plan for any of the issues that we had. And also, you know, when you don't work with an attorney and all of a sudden you have to get a quadro done to divide up your um, retirement accounts, that can be very tricky to do on your own. So there are so many great suggestions that I've heard from you over the years in just talking to you about the area, you know, about the many areas of divorce. So I would highly recommend that if you are in that pressure cooker now, like Anna described, to reach out. The good thing is this though, you reach out to an attorney now, you establish a relationship. Hannon, what are some things that people can do then to save money on legal bills? What, for instance, with their financial situation, can they start to discuss with you and then bring back to the table with their soon-to-be ex-significant other? Let me tell you what I worry about. My concern is when parties are not equally or close to equally situated, that somebody has much more of the information, the knowledge, the power, the influence, and the other party is pretty much going along for the ride. And that <laughs> results in terrible, predictably terrible outcomes, and sometimes ones that are hard to get out of. Not impossible, but it does add a degree of difficulty. Okay. So when you have people who are fairly similarly situated in terms of their brain power, their understanding of the issues. Um, you can save a lot of time and a lot of money. You can work together. There are plenty of things to be done. When you talk, Jennifer, about sitting down with your ex or ex-to-be and figuring out um, a, an, an agreement to work through and work by, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, my suggestion is that people take those um, proposals and have them independently reviewed just in case they missed something because sometimes people do and again it's harder to you know kind of get around that than if you handle it right the first time as i like to say in the garment industry and the logging industry you want to measure twice cut <laughs> once so this is one of those there these are big issues people could be married 10 20 30 40 years they can have children who are 5, 10, 18, 23. And, you know, these are big major commitments that need to be looked at. So doing it yourself, yes, on a proposal basis. But at some point, it's helpful to get that attorney review, which is not that time consuming, not that expensive. It actually will add to the piece. As far as the uh, parties working these things out, what you had is... I find fairly rare. You have two people of goodwill who are motivated clearly by the best interests of the children. That's the standard that the law uh, imposes and applies. It's the standard that people should be thinking about every single day, whether they're in a divorce setting or not. That's the highest standard that you can hold yourselves to. And it's real. You have to ask yourself, okay, how am I coming out of this? How's my spouse coming out of it? But most importantly, what's going to be the long-term impact on my kids? And use that as a guide to figure out if you have to choose between options uh, that may break the tie for you in a good way. Getting, yeah. getting therapeutic intervention to be helpful, getting a mediator 
um, having the parties counsel contact each other. You know, back in the day, we used to talk about it takes a village to get these people divorced, <laughs> uh, which is a takeoff on it takes a village to raise a child. I, I truly believe that. It does not add much money to the process to get the experts involved that you need. You want to figure it out well, and you want to do it the first time as best you can. You can always modify, especially if the parties are willing to. I said before that I would say a word about cooperation. Cooperation is the biggest money saver and time and aggravation saver in the history of divorce and other negotiation. If you can have the goodwill, Jennifer, that you and your ex had and bring it to any situation, if two plus two is four, that's what we want to focus on. We want to get there quickly. We want to get there efficiently. We want to get there with a the minimum of time and dollars. If you have one party who says two plus two is five and the other one who says two plus two is minus one, you're in trouble. It's going to cost you 10 to figure out who's right about that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you bring up a great point because now while the pressure cooker is on and people are possibly living with people that they want to divorce, it's actually never been more acceptable not to go into the offices, right? So you can set up these types of calls like your office is doing Zoom. You know, you can set up a very private confidential call with your office and even with you know, both parties sitting there on the phone uh, and talk about some of the issues. Talk to me a little bit, because parents are really concerned about how divorce affects their children. And with your years of experience, you've certainly tried to protect children as much as possible. So as parents are possibly sitting around the table discussing how this is going to work, what do they have to worry about with parenting time and holidays and how they're going to divide up the kids? Well, one point to be made is that when they're having these conversations in this small, closed environment, the children should not be sitting there listening. Oof, good one. Uh, this is very, very important. It's really not their place. It's not their job. Uh, they need to do their growing up job, and the parents need to protect them and take care of them. The things to think about, uh, one would be a parenting time schedule. Again, you can do that instantly. It can even be in the context of this sheltering experience. Uh, certainly, it can anticipate that at some point everybody gets liberated and they can move on. They can get apartments. They can live with their own parents or whatever it is. Uh, but start talking about where are the children going to live? What about the overnights? What about the holidays and the vacations and the school holidays? All those pieces need to be figured out. From the court's point of view, in my experience, they mostly want to know, before they even look at finance, what's going on with the children. Is there going to be a custody fight? If there's going to be a custody fight, my friend, we're talking about thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per person, because it's not only the intense uh, work that the lawyers need to do, but there are also expert witnesses who have to be hired and paid. And those folks can be very expensive. And basically, a lot of times, not all the time, but many times you have a report that comes back saying, you know, Jack and Jill are both loving parents and they have excellent relationships with their kids. Their styles are different and they don't approve of each other's styles. But at the end of the day, they're fully capable of co-parenting. Well, that's kind of a kick in the behind because you could have figured that out yourself early on if you could. <laughs> Sometimes people think of pathology where none exists. Now, on the other hand, if you have a substance abuse case, if you have a domestic violence, whether it involves child uh, abuse or uh, the other parent, uh, those are not cooperative matters. They're really not. And there you're gonna need a strong advocate to help you pick through how do we get to our final destination uh, but it's going to involve experts and a fair amount of, of struggle. So uh, part of this is diagnostic. Uh, right. The lawyers can actually sit with people and based on their description of what happened, not 100% relying on it because sometimes we get surprised. There's more evidence or information that we didn't know. We talk to the other lawyer who says, you know, your client has a drug abuse issue. Uh, no, I actually <laughs> didn't know that. And then you go back to your own client who maybe denies it. Well, then I guess we have to start with um, 
some type of uh, evaluation of substance abuse. So whatever the issues are, we have ways of dealing with them, but the child custody and parenting time is a number one. Everything else is by co contrast, a much smaller set of concerns, even though they're important, it's, it's just smaller. Yeah, and I would encourage people, you know, to call into the office, get some suggestions, and also realize that a parenting schedule that you put in place now when your children are younger will need to change as your life moves forward, as your professional life moves forward, and as your kids move forward, right? I mean, when we first divorced, we were nesting the children. They were always in one house. We, John and I, I was in graduate school finishing up my PhD. John was working in New York City and Texas sometimes. So we had a lot of flexibility with our kids and our kids didn't need to move back and forth. Once they were in high school, it, didn't, it wasn't as necessary for us to maintain that home. So what we wound up doing was going to a schedule we went from the day-to-day, week-to-week kind of schedule, which we were fine with because the kids were always very stable, but we went to one week on, one week off, and we switched on Friday nights. And it gave our kids the opportunity to relax into a weekend with a parent, go and look forward then to seeing the, the parent, the parent, the other parent the following Friday. So I think that there, it's so important to work with an attorney because while John and I had great peace, we had no idea that that plan would ever need to change. And an attorney like you can say, look, based on my experience here, this is a great schedule, but we're going to need to write in some language that says things can change. And I know Absolutely. that- yeah, and a lot of parents are also super concerned about holidays, right? Holidays are where we impart to our kids our culture and our tradition. And I know that they're looking for guidance from you. Now, John and I entrenched our kids in, hol in specific holidays with each of us. For instance, Thanksgiving was always very important to my family and I. Easter, not so much. So we were able to you know, give and take. And then as again, as time marched on and family members may have passed away and family members on one side were alone or not, you know, we were incredibly flexible that way, but fair. And that is where if you are going into a situation, if you're sitting in a situation right now where you don't think the parenting time schedule is fair or, you know, that you were having some significant problems, get on the phone. You know, get on a Zoom call with the office and just say, hey, what are some ideas for us to work this out? It is so important. Um, I agree. I agree. Jennifer, you are um, rare, <laughs> an excellent guide for people because you've Thank been you. through it. And what you just described is a superb summary of the process that people need to go through. One comment that I would add here, parents are not uniformly... Um, the, the people, the individuals that the kids need at any given time. So you may start out a custodial arrangement, which basically means who's spending more of the time every day, every week with the, ch the child or children. Um, but it may start out saying, well, mom is the primary custodial parent or the uh, primary residence, residential parent. Um, at some point, a child or children may say, I want to live with dad. Right. You know, maybe the arrangement worked for eight, 10 years, but now things are different. I have a matter right now I'm working on where a mid teens child has basically told one of the parents, I'm not comfortable staying with you on a shared basis. I just don't like it for the reasons that he has. And so we're working on that. We are actively saying what needs to be done differently now. How is that going to affect child support, for example, and other things? So these flexibility is a, just a tremendous asset. You know, good problem solving skills, goodwill for heaven's sake. You can't put a price tag on that. Um, cooperation works way better than contention in every way possible. And as the parents deal with their stress level on these issues, it will filter down to where the children are better adjusted. But the opposite is also true. If there's a certain level of tension that just cannot be handled well, the children are going to get the virus. It's, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> in a time of virus, this is a different virus, but it's very uh, troubling and it can even get lethal. So yes, we want uh, good parental modeling, we want cooperation, we want flexibility, we want problem solving. And your lawyers 
should model that as well. Yeah, and when you are, I know a lot of people who get divorced and they, you know, throw down their fists or the gauntlet as the saying goes and they want their day in court. Nothing will be more expensive than or disappointing than having a judge, even with all of their goodwill, make decisions for you and your family. Sometimes it can be advantageous for the financial side out of fairness and long-term um, you know, possibilities. But when it comes to your children, you and your ex-spouse will always be their family together. You'll become grandparents together. You'll go have to go through graduations. And the idea is that when one person draws a line in the sand of peace, the other person will hopefully raise their game to meet you there. And that is not only critical for everyone, it's a lot less expensive in your divorce bills. <laughs> Because nothing is, like I said before, you know, nothing is going to be more expensive than having your day in court and completely unnecessary and stressful. And that will bleed down to your kids for sure. I, I agree, Jennifer. My experience over many, many years is that people have their principles and they feel strongly about them. They see things how they do. Sometimes it's hard even for the lawyers to, uh, to reason with that sensibility. I've had uh, clients in the early years of my practice who were inmates and serving 30, 40, 200 years on death row. And they would look at me like children and say, when the judge hears my case, everything is going to be different, whatever the issue was. I couldn't believe it, but it's because we're raised with that idea of having your day in court. What I encourage people to do, which I think is much more effective, is have their day in mediation. Work with a trained therapeutic mediator, work with a, a child-based um, you know, individual who's got the training and the experience, and it's pennies on the dollar. The judge does not know you. The judge doesn't have the time to get to know you. They have the most important case to them unfortunately, in many cases, is the one right after yours. Right. So they're looking to get through. They might do their best job and come up with a 60% response. Um, I've had a situation I remember many years ago where I had two individuals, two parties in the middle of a divorce on the opposite sides of a wall, and there was a doorway in between. And my client is on one side saying, I always lose when I come to court. And I go through the door and the husband's saying, I never get what I want when I come to court. And I'm like, epiphany, <laughs> you know, what we, what we try to do in litigation. And sometimes we have no choice. If there's a substance issue or a domestic violence issue, sometimes we have to duke it out and, and get the judge's input and hope that they're Solomonic about it. Um, but uh, oftentimes there's disappointment with that. You know, you can end up with a lose-lose outcome. Neither party uh, gets what they want. So what we try to do in the negotiating world, again, as long as there's no domestic violence happening actively and there's no uh, substance abuse that's active, is we can negotiate these things. The lawyers can send the parties to a mediator, to a therapeutic individual, to try to help them work out the parenting time uh, and custodial issues best they can, or at least narrow the issues. And then if that doesn't work, we're going to get a forensic uh, uh, expert involved who is a therapist, a psychologist, sometimes a psychiatrist, to do a full evaluation, testing of the parties, testing of the children, you know, contacting collateral sources who can come up with a set of uh, recommendations that the court may or may not accept. Um, Sometimes we can stop the process short and just get those recommendations and say to the parties, this is what the judge is going to be dealing with. Do you wish to modify your point of view? You know, kind of as a last effort to get the matter resolved. And sometimes that works. Okay. We can go to mediation. We can choose a private arbitrator who's a former judge or a seasoned attorney and put the case before them and say, where are we going with this? Sometimes you can combine that. You start out with mediation. If there's any sticking points, um, empower that individual to make the decision. So there's a lot of, of options that are available in terms of process today. 
uh, that the people can choose for themselves, uh, but the court is going to be the backstop. Okay, great. Um, now, leading from that, I want to talk about options, especially in situations right now of domestic violence. With we, I keep bringing up the pressure cooker that people are living in, and one aspect of life that a lot of the news outlets are not talking about, but that we know is probably a problem out there, are people that were living in domestic violence situations that are right now heightened. We all know that the standard first step for anyone who is living with any sort of domestic violence situation, either against themselves or against their children, or possibly both, is to get to safety immediately. So I was actually shocked when I started working in the area of um, marketing for family and divorce attorneys that you guys are the ones that handle domestic violence issues. It's handled by family court. Could you talk about the process that someone should go through if they are in a situation that is not safe and um, what happens if it's escalating during this time? Sure. Domestic violence, as a matter of New Jersey public policy, is that it should be reduced and eliminated, if possible. Uh, that's a priority for the legislature and the court system. So there have been um, provisions for decades where people on an emergent basis can contact the court system and get relief from the problem that they have. You take the current circumstance where the courts are largely closed to the public, and then you impose on that uh, this idea of having uh, judicial time based on Zoom meetings, it ain't easy. It's, it's taking a difficult situation and putting it under pressure. However, what I'd like people to be aware of is that the courts will always say they are open for people who need relief. So the way it would start today would be you get to a point of safety and you make a phone call to the police and you have them come out, which they will, and they'll do a quick investigation and they'll make a decision as to whether or not this appears to be a domestic violence situation. They will offer two things. One of them is longer term, one of them is immediate. The longer term is a complaint in municipal court charging some aspect under the quasi-criminal code, um, which will say uh, could be harassment, stalking, could be terroristic threats, could be assault, could be many, many things along that line. So there's actually a complaint that a police officer will sign and a judge will approve that says in X period of time, there's going to be a hearing. Now, 535 municipalities uh, courts are shut down and things are gonna possibly reopen in May or June, but there's not gonna be an immediate hearing on that. The other aspect, which is the shorter term, is the matter is either going to a municipal court judge or a family court judge at the superior court level to review the facts and make a decision whether this matter uh, requires emergency intervention. And that would be done based on what's called a temporary restraint. It's gonna be based on testimony that somebody today is gonna to raise their right hand and get sworn in and on Zoom say to a judge, your honor, he did this to me, she did that to me. The other parent is, the other party is not present for that. It's okay. done on a one-sided basis because if you invite them, there could be violence that would impede or stop the other parent from making the report. So it can, it's done on a one-sided basis. But there's another hearing that's going to happen in 10 days, two weeks, or whatever schedule the local uh, superior court is following these days that will give the other party and their counsel, if they have one, uh, opportunity to object, opportunity to put in counter evidence and the decision there is going to be do we continue that temporary order and make it final and then what happens if the answer is yes guns come out no that person who the viol the violator uh, cannot own or possess weapons or an id card and there may be a um, uh, support obligation imposed. There can even be a counsel fee obligation imposed for the benefit of the other party. 
there, there can be restrictions on access to children. There can be narrow bases for phone contact, followed by supervised parenting time. There's a lot of pieces that can happen in that relatively short time. Okay. So the, the importance of that is that if you're on what I would call the wrong side of that decision, it's going to have an impact on your custodial rights. That is, when there's a finding of domestic violence as a matter of a final restraining order, there's a presumption that you are not the parent who's best suited to take care of the, the children on a um, primary custodial basis. So that's going to happen. There can be restrictions on flight, meaning, you know, airlines might put wow. you on a list. There can be, there's a registry that you have to, uh, you know, sign up for. Um, there's certain things like that, restrictions. There's, you know, weapons, as I mentioned before, you, there's a ban on, on your possession of same. So there are consequences of magnitude to such a finding, but the system is there. Uh, the courts are open, even if they're open electronically. Okay. Uh, people have the ability to get in there and, and get their needs met. Uh, that's one where I strongly urge people to have legal counsel, even on the preliminary hearing, because what happens in that foundational time is going to have an impact in terms of the final restraint order and even leak into the divorce case based on the things that I mentioned. Wow, that's great advice. Okay, so if you're out there and you're not comfortable with your home situation and you think that there is a safety issue, you absolutely need to get to safety, get the police involved and seek legal counsel. Uh, yes. and I can't stress enough how important that process is. Now, Hannah, before we go, I know that you stay very up to date on the news that's going on in the world of divorce and child custody. And there was a case, I believe it was in Florida, in Miami, with a doctor who uh, is, a, she's an emergency room doctor, and she recently had her child taken away from her because of her possible exposure to COVID while at work. Could you go over the facts of the case for us and just walk us through why this was necessary possibly or not and just give your opinion on the case and what's going on? Yes, these are terribly difficult situations. We're in an extraordinary time. You have somebody there who's on the front lines of COVID and dealing with patients and their problems, including their virus issues, et cetera. And even with complete battalion-like clothing and a headset and, and, and all of these things, there's always a possibility of um, becoming infected. So here's a case where the parties were sharing custody, uh, each in their own location, and the child would go back and forth. The father became uncomfortable, basically saying, I respect and admire what my wife, my ex-wife is doing, but I'm worried about my child. And the, the ex-wife said, hey, if we were living together as husband and wife, my friend, I would go to work, I would come home, we would be sheltering together, and nobody would say a word about it. That case went to a judge who, on a temporary basis, said, if there is a realistic risk to that child, who I believe is eight years old, of becoming infected, I am not going to permit that mother to continue to have the kind of unrestricted access as she did before the virus hit. However, she shall have daily access electronically, FaceTime other, with the child. She shall have the right to get compensatory parenting time. So every day that went by that she did not see her child, she will have the right to have that child uh, when things become, quote unquote, normalized. Um, my mediation community went back and forth on this. And one of the more interesting um, responses was a number of people saying, hey, I'm a mother. If I were in that situation, I would... I wouldn't need a judge. I wouldn't need a lawyer. I would say to my ex, here, take this child. And I will talk with her every day on FaceTime. And when things are done, I would like some compensatory time. Now, I think that's a great gesture. I totally understand it. Um, 
when people can work things out in that type of cooperative fashion, it's great. In this case, mom felt strongly, you know, like, what are you doing to me? I've had other people respond and say, um, judges in New Jersey would have been tougher on the father. Tell us exactly how strong the risk is. How do you know that? You know, prove it to me. So you're going to get different responses to it. I mean, I'm going to say, based on the information that this judge had, I think he did a pretty good job, my opinion. Uh, people, Reasonable people could differ. Uh, but these things are happening. I am sure there are cases that I don't know about that aren't necessarily hitting the press right now that deal with exactly the same set of issues right here in New Jersey. They're tough. You know, they say tough cases make bad law <laughs> because you got people who are trying to stretch in one direction or another, and they might kind of screw it up for other people who are in that circumstance. So uh, difficult times, difficult choice, and I hope things work out for the best for that family. Yeah, and I just want to say, you know, I agree with you in that I think that, that the compensatory um, provision of making up the parenting time later is reasonable in a horrendous situation. But also, you know, as parents out there who even are just starting the divorce process to get back to that, judges, even in the most extreme cases, the law is very specific in that the child is going to benefit from a relationship with both parents. So sure. I don't believe in any way that the judge was saying that the mother was unfit or that the situation or that, you know, the father was going to do a better job. I think that the problem was in this, you know, for a very short amount of time, what truly is in the best interest of the child's health. So yeah. judges are never out there to penalize. And like I said, you know, even with parents who are drug addicts and alcoholics, there are always ways and provisions made so that both parents not only enjoy a relationship with their child, but that the child maintains a relationship with both parents, because as we know, that's what's healthiest for the kid. I agree. So I also want to say that you, you bring up an amazing, important point. Um, judges are symbols. They're symbols. They're important symbols, and they can have impacts. Mostly they're there like mom or dad. <laughs> Now, children, I really want you to work this out. And people who go to court hoping for that answer, they go to the mom or dad you know, figure, and they want the answer, and to have it come back saying, why don't you go outside the courtroom and sit down with so-and-so and see if you can't work this out, is just, for some people, a terrible, terrible problem. For others, since we know that, it's not really a question of when. I'm sorry, it's not a question of whether the matter is going to resolve. They resolve in 98% of the cases that start out in court, let alone right. the bucket loads of cases that resolve before they even start the court process. So we know there's going to almost certainly be a uh, settlement outcome. The question is, wh when does it happen? And what are these specific terms and conditions? And if you can't figure that out, that's when you start bringing in the village, the experts, <laughs> right. financial experts, the emotional experts, whoever else you need to. It doesn't matter. We could get the shaman involved if that's helpful. <laughs> Whatever it takes, right? <laughs> Whatever it takes. Exactly the motto. Well, Hannon, I really thank you. I can't um, stress enough to our people that are out there. We've ha I've been watching the tech of all of this go back and forth between our video here and s our call and then what's going on. We've had people popping on and off of the Facebook Live. Anyone out there that has any legal questions, Hannon's office, the Kingston Law Group, is open to answer them. We want you guys to be safe. We want you to find peace. And uh, as you live in your little pressure cooker, just know that there is a village out there that can help you and is working very hard to stay in touch with you during this time. However, you need to do that. Jennifer, I just want to say, people, if they want to call, 609-683-7400. 609-683-7400. Operators are literally <laughs> standing by. Great. Well, Hannah, Thank thanks Jennifer. so much for your time. Fabulous. Appreciate your help. Bye. Bye.